What's that? I've got good news. That's the mule wash is going to. Come back in style. What the f does that even mean? Hey guys, welcome back to our Twin Peaks watch party. We're now on episode three of the famous series by Lynch and Frost, and now things are starting to feel truly Lynchian. I hope you all have a damn fine cup of coffee and a piece of cherry pie, because today we're going to Twin Peaks. The episode starts off quietly. The horns are all sitting around eating dinner. Their table is large and they all sit far apart, not talking to each other. The image makes us see how fractured the family is. They're not a cohesive unit. They're four separate people. They might as well not be a family. This leads me to an overall thought about the show. Lynch isn't afraid to open up the show on such a slow note. The show as a whole is much slower paced than many shows releasing today. He generally allows scenes to breathe and the pacing imitates the pace of living in a small town while still being a soap opera. Watching the show after being barraged by hyperactive content and shows in 2023, well, it's a breath of fresh air. But this quiet, awkward family dinner comes to a close when Ben's brother Jerry arrives. He's just come back from Paris and he brings back a bunch of baguette and brie sandwiches. He and Ben eat the sandwiches with what I can only describe as lust. Hey, when in Rome. Mmm. Mmm. After they eat, they exchange a quick few words outside of the dining room. Ben tells Jerry about the failed deal and the fact that Laura died, which depresses Jerry. So Ben decides that to cheer their spirits up, they should go to One-Eyed Jack's since there's a new girl there. There's a new girl at One-Eyed Jack's. Freshly scented from the perfume counter. But let's pause the scene for a second. Lynch shows us the true nature of the Horn brothers in this quick exchange. Ben delivers all the news at once. The news of the failed deal and the news of Laura's death. Jerry is way more saddened by the news of the deal than by her passing. Her death is just the cherry on top. Leland's daughter was murdered and the Norwegians left. Did they, sir? Now is a good time to talk about the jokey or shit posty names in the show. The brothers are named Ben and Jerry, like the ice cream. The brothel is called One-Eyed Jacks, which is a euphemism for a penis. And the show is called Twin Peaks, which might refer to its placement in the mountains, but is most definitely a double entendre. For those of you who still don't get it, it means boobs. Why do you think there's a Hooters competitor named Twin Peaks? I've never been to the restaurant, but I do hear that their wings are pretty good. However, I highly doubt that they're as good as B-dubs. At the One-Eyed Jacks, the interior is warmer than most of the other sets in the series. It's a mix of red and wood. The women there all dress in lace, sporting black, white, and red colors, expressing sin and passion. The madam, Blackie, called that because I guess she dresses all in black, introduces herself to some of her favorite customers, Ben and Jerry, informing them of the new girl. Ben, acting romantic, recites a Shakespearean sonnet to her as the courtesans present themselves. Then the new girl appears. Ben and Jerry flip a coin to see who gets to have the new girl first, and Ben wins. Ben walks to the new girl. On her face, we don't see a woman seeking to seduce a man. We see a frightened and sad woman, a woman afraid of what she must do, a woman who doesn't want to be there. His voracious lust contrasts her melancholy, and we can't help but feel bad for her. It's a quietly tragic scene. She pulls him into the red curtains. The red curtains that serve as the entrance to the bedrooms looks a lot like a vagina. We don't have to see them having sex. We're seeing them go through the Yana curtains already. If that small conversation a bit earlier didn't already paint Ben and Jerry as scumbags, then this surely does. They are ravenous men, fueled by lust, for money, sex, and other sensory pleasures. They are the libertines of Twin Peaks. Let's see what old Coop is up to. He's being his normal, happy-go-lucky self in his hotel room when the phone rings. <laughs> it's Hawk. He tells him about the one-armed man. 
the man we saw in the last episode walk into the morgue. Soon after, someone slips a note under Coop's door. It reads, Jack with one eye. Who gave the note to Cooper? When he steps out into the hallway, there's no one there. Could it be Audrey? Maybe she knows about her dad's favorite brothel, but maybe she doesn't. Perhaps she eavesdropped on their conversation when he was talking to Jerry, but she doesn't exactly realize what the place really is. It could also have been sent by Ben, or it was arranged to be sent to Cooper by Ben. What if his move was to dirty the Fed up a little bit? It could be that he doesn't want him poking around, so he seeks to pay the investigator off with pleasures of the flesh. This would also incriminate Cooper, and Ben could use that as leverage and blackmail in case Cooper flies a bit too close to the sun for his liking. Remember, Ben's planning to burn down the Packard sawmill, so this could be a sort of safety measure that he's taking. Really, it could be anybody. It's possible that the tipster was the one-armed man, Ben's wife, or some entity from a different dimension. Who knows? Well, I mean, I know who it was because I've seen the show a whole bunch of times. Chances are you know too. But if this is your first time watching, then I guess you don't know yet. And I'm not about to spoil it. At the same time, Bobby and Mike find themselves in a little bit of trouble. They drive out to the woods to pick up a bag of coke. Their walk through the woods is classic Lynch, as their flashlights illuminate the trees. It reminds me of this one sketch from The Cleveland Show. For those of you who don't know, David Lynch is a recurring actor on the television program. It might be his best work. Hey Gus, what are you auctioning? Copies of my new exercise video. Oh. <laughs> Run faster! You don't want me to catch you! After reaching the tree stump, they find the bag of coke. But along with it, they also find Leo. A very pissed off Leo with a shotgun at that. He wants his money. As we know, that money is now property of Uncle Sam, so he ain't getting that money. You punks owe me ten grand. Leo needs a new pair of shoes. What's strange about this scene is that someone dressed in all black appears behind Leo in the woods. We see him only for an instant and Bobby freaks out at the sight of him. But Leo says not to worry about the guy. Is he back up for Leo? We haven't seen him with anyone else besides Shelly. He's a truck driver, so he's probably a very solitary person. That doesn't mean he doesn't have accomplices. But I would think that if he did have backup, that backup would be standing with him, not hiding in the woods only to pop out for a second to scare Bobby. This leads me to believe that this man is not Leo's friend, but actually someone, or something, else. It's not out of the realm of possibility that it's someone supernatural. It's also possible that he is indeed Leo's backup, and Leo just has a bizarre plan. What really troubles Leo is Shelly's involvement with another guy. He knows that she's seeing someone else because the cigarettes in her ashtray weren't her brand. Leo talks in such a way so as to suggest that he doesn't know who did it, but he thinks that it might be Bobby. This terrifies Bobby. Do you recall the relationship diagram that we had in the first episode of the show? Let's make a small new diagram that's kind of similar. Who wants to kill who? Bobby and Mike want to kill James. Leo seems like he wants to kill Bobby and Mike, and he'll definitely want to kill Bobby once he discovers the truth. Ben and Catherine might not want to kill Josie, but they definitely want to burn her sawmill down and make her destitute. Bob seems to want to kill just about anybody. While we're still focusing on the nighttime, let's look at the two more light-hearted stories. James and Donna exchange sweet nothings, confess their love to each other before making out. And Big Ed tracks Grease into the house and messes up Nadine's invention. It pisses her off so much that she bends the metal on her rowing machine. I think Ed should be careful with his affair with Norma. After seeing her sheer brute strength, I wouldn't want to make Nadine angry. Or maybe I would. I do love a strong mama. <laughs> I'm going to have the world's first 100% quiet runner. All this has happened in one night, as the third episode picks up exactly where episode two, or episode one, whatever you want to call it, ended. But now we're on to the next day. It's now a beautiful morning in Twin Peaks, which means that it's the perfect time for a lecture on the history of Tibet, as well as the implementation of an esoteric deductive method that Cooper learned in a dream. For all this really came from a dream? Yes. He places a bottle 60 feet and 6 inches away from where he stands. He has Andy stand next to the bottle. Truman reads the names. Lucy puts the check marks next to the names if the stones hit the bottle, and Hawk holds the bucket of stones. The goal, find out which J name Laura was afraid to meet. On the chalkboard are a list of characters we've gotten to know so far, and this scene serves as a reminder of who is which character. Also on the board is Jack with one eye. 
but they cross it out when Truman informs Cooper that it's a brothel on the other side of the Canadian border. I like the exchange they have with Lucy in this part. Agent Cooper, I'm going to erase this because it's a, a place and not a person. Actually, maybe the person could be in the place. So should I erase it? Yes. Most of the stones don't hit. One stone bounces off the tree and hits Andy in the head. Andy claims it doesn't hurt, to which Truman replies. Where there's no sense, there's no feeling, Andy. <laughs> which name causes the bottle to break? Leo Johnson. This scene marks a slight departure in the show. In the earlier episodes, we saw Cooper playing as Sherlock Holmes, using his keen perception and sense of rationality to uncover clues. Here, however, he uses some kind of mystical method to solve the case. As I said in a previous video, rationality can only take him so far in this town. He's beginning to embrace the irrational, and with it, the show is becoming weirder. But maybe, within the show, it's actually quite rational. It didn't work for me when I used the same technique to predict the Oscars, but maybe I'm just not as well trained in it as Coop. What I gather it does is that it doesn't tell Coop anything he doesn't already know. He hears a name and his subconscious guides his body. If he, deep down, feels like one of them is heavily involved, then this technique informs him of who he has a hunch about. So it is embracing his more irrational side, I suppose, but he already has a lot of info on these people, so it's somewhere between rational and irrational. At the Double R Diner, Audrey drinks coffee. Maybe in the future, I'll make a video about how many cups of coffee are consumed during Twin Peaks. Now that would be a monumental task. As she drinks her coffee, she talks to Donna and gushes about Cooper, but she doesn't keep the conversation on her infatuation with the Fed for very long. She pivots the conversation to ask Donna if Laura ever talked about her father, Ben Horn. Donna doesn't recall Laura ever mentioning Ben, to which Audrey replies that Ben used to sing to her. This is obviously kind of a cryptic response, but hey, uh, this is Twin Peaks. Why would Ben sing to Laura? We know that Leland and Ben were close business partners, so it could just be that Ben saw Laura as a niece, but Audrey's delivery suggests that it's something stronger, perhaps stranger. Was Laura in a romantic relationship with Ben? Could that even be? Or is Ben Laura's real father? I'm going to refer to the secret diary of Laura Palmer right now to highlight something that isn't discussed in the show. Years before the show takes place, Ben bought Laura a pony. Leland made it seem like it was from him, but she found out that it was Ben who bought it. Leland didn't get her anything. At this point in her life, she was fairly innocent and there's no indication of any wrongdoing or romance between herself and Ben, so I want to throw away that romance angle for now. Considering how distant Ben is from Audrey and Audrey's own distaste or jealousy or whatever you want to call it towards Laura, well, I think there's something to this theory. Audrey's demeanor begins to make a bit more sense when you look at her relationship with Laura as a one-sided sibling rivalry. Laura might not have known that she was Ben's daughter, but I bet Audrey knows, and I bet Leland knows. After their exchange, Audrey does what she does best and dances in the middle of the diner. At the Double R Diner, there's always music in the air. Isn't the music so dreamy? Back at the police station, Hawk arrives with a bloody rag he found on the train tracks and then one of my all-time favorite characters of the show, Albert, arrives. Agent Cooper will be right with you. Yeah, I can hear perfectly well, Curly. Cooper warns Truman that Albert is lacking in social niceties. Truman replies, nobody's perfect. And then Coop does this. Isn't that the truth? All right. <laughs> Albert is a fast-talking investigator who seemingly wants to alienate everybody around him. He might be mean, but he's also just super funny. Of course, he pisses off everyone there, especially Truman, who pulls him aside to threaten him. Because normally if a stranger walked into my station talking this kind of crap, he'd be looking for his teeth two blocks up on Queer Street. At least Coop has Truman's back. Never mind about Laura. There's plenty more trouble brewing in Twin Peaks. Pete and Catherine talk passive aggressively to each other, and we discover that Pete sleeps in a different bedroom. Man, this guy just can't stop taking L's. He's been totally emasculated by his cheating wife, he yearns for a woman who's not into him, and he's caught in the middle of a hostile corporate takeover. <laughs> he just wants to fish, damn it. He hands Josie the key to the safe that holds their books, and lo and behold, there are two ledgers. The plot thickens. What does the plot thickens even mean? I mean, it sounds nice, and I understand what it's saying, but when you actually stop to think about it, 
is it like a soup metaphor like you're adding more ingredients to the soup and so it becomes thicker and less watery i digress in Whitstillman's Barcelona, one of my favorite scenes is when Ted Boynton dances to Pennsylvania 65000 while reading the Bible, only for Fred and his date to walk in on him. Oh, wrong film. In this episode of Twin Peaks, one of my favorite scenes is when Leland Palmer dances to Pennsylvania 65000 while holding the portrait of Laura Palmer, only for Sarah to walk in on him. He screams and moans in mourning and agony, all while Sarah tries to get him to stop but a state of mania is too powerful for her protests. The event ends in the shattering of the picture frame. The shattered glass on top of her image highlights her own shattered self and our destroyed perception of her, or at least the decimated idea of her as the ideal all-American girl. Leland then smears his own blood on her photo. Laura's legacy is no longer one of purity, but of bloodshed, of herself and of others. The romantic idealization of the past is gone, and we can never get it back. Now for the scene in which Twin Peaks really comes into its own, commercially and Stop it, Kino. Stop it. Don't do this again. <sighs> Cooper's dream. He finds himself in a room not unlike this one. It's a strange place. It reminds me of Carl's dream and Jimmy Neutron. Inside this room is a little man. Cooper sits in a chair. He's old. Then, Lynch intercut sequences from the international cut of the pilot. The one-armed man recites a poem. Through the darkness, a future past. The magician longs to see. One chance out between two worlds. Fire, walk with me. The man Cooper seeks, Bob, lives above a convenience store. And the one-armed man, named Mike, was once touched by the devilish one and got a tattoo of it on his arm. But when he saw the face of God, he cut his arm off. Wait till you learn what happened to that arm. We're back in the red room. Laura is now with us. Or is it Laura? She says that she's not Laura, but the little man's cousin. They speak strangely. We can understand them, but their words are warped and twisted. How they managed to pull off this effect for their dialogue is that they would speak backwards, and then in post-production, they would reverse it. Anyways, let's get back to the analysis. Ask the mule why he's going to come back in style. This line has confused many people for decades and caused much debate. You can read all the theories online, but the one that convinces me the most is this line is a reference to Judy Garland, whose actual last name was Gum. Lynch has a history love of The Wizard of Oz, and there's a new documentary about that film's inspiration on Lynch's work. So I think that this might be a reference to that film. Laura was sort of a regular girl, I guess, who got sent to a different world as a result of a catastrophe, and now she's stuck in that place. Cooper sits with the three of them in this space that looks like a room behind a stage. He's found himself behind the curtains, and in this exchange behind the curtains, he learns more about how the world works. But still, many, many things are enigmas. Cooper can't believe that she's not Laura. She says that she feels like she knows her, but sometimes her arms bend backward. Then, the man from another place claims that she's filled with secrets. The man from another place then gets up to dance while Laura whispers something in Cooper's ear. We cannot hear what they're saying. In this scene, we can see a floating shadow on the curtains, suggesting that this room is just one small part of a greater whole. There are other entities all around them. Maybe this is a space in which beings from beyond can communicate with people from our world. I guess we'll find out more about it later. The dream ends and Cooper calls Truman. He knows who the killer is. He then snaps to the beat of the song that the little man danced to. Was he in a dream space or was he somewhere real? She must have told him the killer's name, but like the end of the last episode, they used that pesky sound design to keep it from us. I'll end this video with just some extra thoughts on the dream. It's going to get explored more in depth in the coming episodes, so I won't go totally ham on it now, but I will say that I think it actually is Laura Palmer. Dying, in the world of Twin Peaks at least, might be like waking up from a dream. The events of your life, your personality, everything are with you but faded. You can kind of sort of remember who you were in the dream, but you feel separate from it, distant. Your dream self wasn't the real you, but there is a connection. I can't wait for the next episode. Will Coop forget his dream, or will it take him down the correct path to find the killer? I guess we'll find out next time. Anyways, guys, I've been the Kino Corner, and I will see you all in the next video. Cherry pie time.